um, specifically uh, dispersion forces for all molecules, dipole-dipole forces for polar molecules, and hydrogen bondings for anything with an OH and NH or HF. Um, now we're going to look at some of the properties related to intermolecular forces. Now the properties that we've already talked about that are directly proportional with intermolecular forces are melting point and boiling point. So as the um, intermolecular forces go up, the melting point and the boiling point go up. In this section, we're going to talk about viscosity, surface tension, enthalpy of vaporization, and enthalpy of fusion. Ultra, also, interestingly, there's one property that's inversely proportional with intermolecular forces, and that is vapor pressure. Said another way, if the intermolecular forces go up, the vapor pressure actually goes down. So what I'd like to do in this section is talk about each of these things, and then at the end, look at a few um, example questions um, basically that um, ask about one of these properties as opposed to asking directly about intermolecular forces. What's really important to remember is whether the property being asked about is either directly or inversely proportional to intermolecular forces. So let's talk about each of the properties one at a time. The first one is viscosity. And viscosity you may um, have heard about when it comes to motor oil. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a second. Or honey is a viscous liquid. Both motor oil and honey are um, have higher viscosities than water. Okay, they're thicker, they're more syrupy, however you want to say it. But viscosity, from a kind of a scientific uh, definition, is a liquid's ability to resist flow. So how would they measure that? Well, if we look at these um, SAE numbers for different uh, motor oils, we have 20, 30, 40, and 50, okay? And these me this measures how well oil flows at 100 degrees Celsius. So what they'll do is they'll take this metal ball bearing and they'll drop it, okay? A, um, a less viscous, a 20 number, the um, ball bearing will drop faster. In the case of a more viscous liquid, the ball bearing will drop slower. Why? Because the molecules of the liquid have to get out of the way. And this is a thicker, more syrupy, from a practical perspective, type of liquid. So the molecules are less able to get out of the way, and the ball bearing falls to the bottom more slowly. And that's basically um, how it works. So the stronger you have of intermolecular forces, the more these molecules are going to want to stick together and not get out of the way of the ball bearing, and therefore the, uh, the higher the viscosity of the liquid. So as we said a minute ago, viscosity is directly proportional to um, intermolecular forces because the stronger intermolecular forces, the more the liquid is going to stick together and the more it's going to resist flow, which is what viscosity is. The next one is surface tension. So surface tension can be thought of in several ways. But if we look at this example, um, the, here is a ball of water in space where we don't have um, gravitational issues. So <laughs> issues, I guess there isn't gravity. So the, the water will form the most, um, I don't know, the shape that is most, um, conducive to be formed. I don't know if that's a good way of saying it, but let's put it this way. The shape which has the lowest surface area is a sphere. So if you have water in space, the water will form a sphere. Now here the water is been colored green so that you can see it better, but it does form this sphere because a sphere is a shape with the least surface tension and there's no gravity, so this is just floating in air. If you take a look at a freshly waxed car, you can see this um, a similar effect here. In a fresh UX car, of course, there's still gravity, right, if the car's on Earth, but um, the water beats up. Why does it beat up? Because a sphere can't form a perfect sphere because of gravity, but a sphere is a, is a shape with the least amount of surface. So why does this happen? Well, here's basically the way of looking at this, okay? Um, we have these water molecules at the surface and these water molecules below. As we talked about before, water molecules have hydrogen bonding, so they have relatively strong intermolecular forces. Um, so if we look here, this water molecule that's not at the surface has lots of neighbors. It wants to have neighbors because it's attracted to its neighbors. So the more neighbors that it has, the more stable of a position this is. 
this molecule at the surface has less neighbors because some of its neighbors are air molecules or empty space, whatever, um, at the surface. So here it has this water molecule at the surface has less neighbors than this water molecule not at the surface. So why does water form a sphere? Well, it forms a sphere because that's the shape where you have the least amount of water molecules at the surface. It's the most efficient shape in that sense. What does that lead to? Well, it leads to a small surface tension of water. And here you can see a very small light bug that's actually able to walk on that water because if its little leg pushed through there, you would have to increase the amount of surface temporarily for its leg to push through. Since the water molecules want as little surface as possible because they're attracted to each other, the very light bug is actually able to stay on the surface because they don't want to make more surface for the leg to push through. Now, let's put this a little bit into perspective. The surface tension of water at 20 degrees C is 7.72.8 uh, millijoules per meter squared. A meter squared of water, you know, a little over three feet by three feet square of water, and it's 72.8 millijoules. So it's not a lot of energy, right? If you throw a rock on the water, we all know that'll easily break the surface and go right down into um, the water. So little bug, can walk because it's a relatively uh, light thing and it doesn't have enough energy to push through, but other things do. End of the day, surface tension is directly proportional to intermolecular forces. Why is it directly proportional to intermolecular forces? Because the more these molecules are attracted to each other, the less they're going to want to be at the surface. So if, you know, I don't think that's exactly the right way of saying it, but the more they're attracted to each other, the less, the more um, unstable one at the surface is going to be, and therefore the higher surface tension. So at the end of the day, the surface tension is directly proportional to intermolecular forces. Let's look at the next um, kind of things that happen uh, because of these um, intermolecular forces and these are similar to surface tension. So the first thing we want to look here is capillary action. Okay, and let's look at water. So capillary action is the ability of a liquid to resist flow against or to resist gravity and flow in the opposite direction. So normally, okay, if we have a small glass tube here, um, you wouldn't expect that water would flow up it. Why? Because gravity would mean that you should have the same water level inside of the tube here. It should be down here as outside of the tube. But that's not what actually happens. A force called capillary action actually draws these water molecules up into the tube. And this is actually based on two forces. Cohesive forces are the attraction um, of the water molecules for themselves. So, so cohesive is kind of like an internal force between different water molecules. So these water molecules in the middle are pulled up um, by other water molecules. But then there's these other type of forces called adhesive forces. And these adhesive forces happen at the surface of the glass. And for the water molecules that are very close to the surface of the glass, they can actually attract to the surface of the glass as well. And then they draw the water molecules in the middle up with them. And what you end up with is capillary action this liquid resists the force of gravity and flows in the opposite direction of gravity. What do you notice? If the tube is thicker, you don't get as much capillary action. Why is that? Because these water molecules in the middle have to draw even more and more water molecules up with them, and it doesn't work as well, and therefore they're not able to do that. So we end up with this type of situation. Another thing that we can notice is by the shape of this meniscus. Now, um, if you've ever, when you've worked in the lab, you've probably seen one of these meniscus. So this is a naturally natural thing that, occur, that occurs. What we can tell from this meniscus is the adhesive forces are actually stronger than the cohesive forces. And how do we know that? We know that because close to the water, excuse me, where the water is close to the glass, it's actually up higher than in the middle. So therefore, the water sticks to the glass more than it does to itself. So that's why we get this meniscus in this direction with water. It turns out glass is very polar. So the polar water molecules are very attracted to the glass and then they can resist flow. What about mercury, which is very nonpolar? Theoretically, mercury will actually have the opposite effect and will actually sink down. 
Why is that? Because mercury is not attracted to glass at all. So this causes the opposite effect to occur. So instead of raising up, it actually can sink down. The other thing to notice about the mercury is we have the opposite meniscus. Because in this case, the mercury is more attracted to itself in the middle and less attracted to the glass. So it's actually lower by um, the glass and higher in the middle because its cohesive forces are stronger than its adhesive forces. So this is basically um, how um, capillary action works and it's basically a result of surface tension. Now if we look at another example of capillary action, here we have wine in a paper towel. In this case, the paper towel is made of cellulose, which is also very polar. And the wine, which is mostly water um, and ethanol, can move up this paper towel because those are polar molecules. And as they're attracted to these things, okay, they pull other water molecules up. So same idea, cohesive and adhesive forces, but you can actually have a liquid flow through what we would call a cellulose um, stationary phase because the cellulose the paper towel isn't moving but the liquid is moving up through it and in the lab we do something called chromatography um, which is based on this exact uh, phenomenon or one type of chromatography that's based on this exact phenomenon so now that we've talked a little bit about um, um, viscosity and surface tension, let's look at some phase change um, type of information. And in this case, what we're looking at is vapor pressure. So let's look at the, this um, flask, which is a closed flask containing water at the bottom at time zero. This is time zero, and this is time sometime after zero, okay? So when we initially pour water into this flask, theoretically, there are no water molecules in the gas phase, okay? So the humidity is zero, there's no water molecules in the gas phase. What's gonna happen? Well, some of these water molecules at any temperature above absolute zero, all right, well, all these mole water molecules are gonna be moving. And some of the water molecules are actually gonna have enough energy to fly into the gas phase. And when they do fly into the gas phase, we get some water molecules now in the gas phase. We could think of this as like humidity, okay? How do we measure the amount of gas mo molecules in the gas phase? Well, if you remember from the ideal gas law chapter, PV equals NRT. What we actually measure is not moles of water molecules in the gas phase. Instead, we measure the vapor pressure, okay? So we measure it by pressure instead of measuring it by moles, but these two things are of course related to each other by PV equals NRT. What eventually happens? What eventually happens is we, really, we reach this dynamic equilibrium where the rate of water molecules going into the gas phase and the rate of water molecules going into the recondensing into the liquid phase becomes equal. Note that the rate of two opposite processes is what's equal. The rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation become exactly equal. What is not equal is the amount of water molecules. There are likely way more water molecules in the liquid phase than there are in the gas phase. That's not equal. But what's equal is the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation. So it won't be the exact same molecules, water molecules in the gas phase, but the pressure of those molecules will be the same because it'll be the same number of those molecules. And then again, because of PB equals NRT. Now let's think about this in terms of intermolecular forces. If these molecules have strong intermolecular forces, they're going to be less likely to fly into the gas phase, which means we'll have less molecules in the gas phase. Well, what's the pressure going to be if we have less molecules? The less molecules we have, the lower the pressure. So therefore, vapor pressure is inversely proportional to intermolecular forces. If these molecules are held together strongly, okay, then they're gonna be less likely to fly in the gas phase and have a lowering of the vapor pressure. This is actually the only um, one of the properties we're gonna talk about that's inversely proportional to intermolecular forces. All the rest are directly proportional. Let's think about this in terms of a uh, temperature effect. 
what's going to happen at low and high temperature. Well, what's, what's going on here is these molecules are all at the same temperature. We're going to compare two different temperatures, but at one time, we're only comparing one temperature. So the molecules are all at the same temperature. But if you look here for the low temperature, okay, this brownish color case, you see that the, not all the molecules are moving at the exact same speed. Some of them are moving slow. Some of them are moving really fast. And if we look here and at this line, this is the minimum amount of energy needed to, risk, to escape. And if we look at this brown curve, you'll see that there is some fraction of molecules, specifically the area under the curve right here, of molecules that have enough energy to escape. If those molecules happen to be at the surface, then they're very likely to escape. If they happen to be down here, they're probably not going to escape because they're probably going to bounce into something else and their energy is going to change before they ever get to the surface. But if they're at the surface and they're moving in their correct direction just by random chance, they're going to escape into the gas phase, causing a vapor pressure. Well, what happens if we move to the black line, a higher temperature? Note that both of these temperatures are lower than the boiling point, okay? Because if you were at the boiling point, basically the top of the curve would have to be um, right here with the amount of kinetic energy required to escape. So essentially this curve would have to be all the way over here. But if we look at the black line, the area under the curve for the proportion of molecules that have enough energy to escape is much higher. So therefore, since more molecules have the energy to escape, they're going to be more likely you know, that you're going to have molecules at the surface, they're going to have enough energy to escape just because there's more of them, and therefore the vapor pressure will be higher. What is the end, what is the, um, end result of this? The vapor pressure is dependent on temperature, and at higher temperatures, molecules are going to have higher vapor pressures because more molecules will escape into the gas phase, thereby exerting a higher pressure. How does this work in terms of um, sweating, keeping us cool. All right, this probably isn't the best uh, picture because this person probably just got out of a pool and isn't this isn't sweat, but who knows? All right. Well, how does this work? Well, when you sweat, you release a thin layer of water vapor onto your skin, and then what happens? Well, what happens is the highest energy molecules are going to fly away, as we talked about before. It's only the high energy molecules, if they happen to be at the surface, they're going to fly away. Now, because your skin has a relatively large surface area and because this is spread out over your body, um, you make the surface very, very large. So if the highest energy molecules are flying away, what happens to the average energy of the rest of them? All right, it's the same as if you have a class, right? If all the students who get A's on the test leave, then the class average is going to be lower. If all the high energy molecules fly into the gas phase, well, then what's left is going to have an average of a lower energy. So at the end of the day, when you sweat, it actually cools your body down because the highest energy molecules leave, leaving the rest of the molecules at a lower temperature or lower average kinetic energy, thereby um, cooling us down. What about vapor pressure and boiling point? Well, what we look at here, um, and this graph is in kilopascals instead of in atmospheres, but this dashed line here would be one atmosphere. So when the vapor pressure of a liquid becomes one atmosphere of pressure, which is 101.3 kilopascals, which is about right here on this line, okay, that is the boiling point. So at water, when water has a vapor pressure of 760 torr or one atmosphere, it's at 100 degrees. For ethanol, it's just under 80 degrees. For ethyl ether, it's around 37 degrees. Um, and these are the boiling points. So essentially what this means is when you, when you um, heat a liquid to its boiling point, its vapor pressure becomes one atmosphere. Said another way, the average molecule has enough energy to fly off into the gas phase, i.e. the liquid boils. Okay, so all of these things are related. The next thing we want to look at is actually um, phase changes and how they work in terms of um, uh, intermolecular forces. So let's take a look at this. Here we have ice at minus 12. So we take this right out of the freezer, it's minus 12 degrees C. Okay, we wait about 10 minutes and the ice is zero degrees C. 
we wait 30 minutes, okay, longer. So we only waited a sh short amount of time. We heated the ice up from minus 12 to zero. We wait 30 minutes later, it's still reading zero degrees C. And only after all of the ice melts does the temperature increase. So one thing that you may not have thought about here is that although this beaker is essentially absorbing heat energy at a constant rate, right, because it's, it's in a warm room relative to the temperature of the ice, the room temperature is much warmer, so it's in a warm room and it's receiving energy or absorbing energy at a relatively a constant rate. However, its temperature change doesn't seem to indicate that, right? It doesn't slowly climb from minus 12 and then not stop. At zero, it stops for quite a long time before it starts to heat up again. And you may not have thought about, well, where is that energy going? We're adding energy, but we're not changing temperature. So where is that energy going? And this is what we want to talk about in terms of enthalpy of fusion and enthalpy of vaporization. So if we look here, if we have this ice at exactly zero degrees Celsius, and we want to turn it into water at exactly zero degrees Celsius, we have to add 6.01 kilojoules per mole of energy. And this is called the enthalpy of fusion. Fusion is the chemistry word for melting, okay? So where does this energy go? It clearly doesn't go to change the temperature because it's at zero degrees to begin with and it's at zero degrees when we finish. Typically, we think of we add, heat, we add heat energy to something and it gets warmer. But in this case, we're adding heat energy to something and it's not getting warmer as we just discussed here, right? We're adding heat at a constant rate, but the temperature isn't changing at a constant rate. Well, where is that energy going? Where that energy is going is in terms of the freedom of these molecules. If we look at ice, these molecules are crystalline and they're in this very specific arrangement where the partially negative oxygen is close to the partially positive hydrogen and that just repeats over and over and over again. When we go to liquid water, it's this more messy arrangement. These molecules have more degrees of freedom and they're able to um, flow around each other more and this is essentially um, a less ordered state let's put it that way and in order to transform from this nice ordered state to this less ordered state we have to add 6.01 kilojoules per mole of energy to transition from zero degrees to zero degrees no temperature change and in the next section we'll actually do some of these math equations okay now let's look at the liquid state to the gas state. In the liquid state, these water molecules, although they're moving all around each other, are still relatively close to each other. In this case, we need to separate them, right? Because a gas is mostly empty space. So if we take this water and heat it to 100 degrees, so we have it at 100 degrees Celsius, and we wanna turn it into steam at 100 degrees, we have to actually add 40.7 kilojoules per mole of energy. Why? Because we're taking these water molecules that are relatively close together and we're turning them into these water molecules that are relatively far apart. So they started off close, now they're far apart. In order to separate these from each other, because remember they're attracted to each other by intermolecular forces, specifically hydrogen bonding, we have to add 40.7 kilojoules per mole. This we call the enthalpy of vaporization, delta H vaporization. Okay, vaporization is another, this is the chemistry word for boiling. Notice the difference between the fusion and the vaporization. The fusion is much smaller, six versus roughly 41. Um, and the reason for that is the amount of change is less, right? We went from ordered to disordered. In this case, we went from close together to far apart. To go from close together to far apart requires much more energy. It is very common that enthalpies of vaporization are higher than enthalpies of fusion. The final thing we want to talk about here is the relationship between these things and intermolecular forces. And I'm going to look at the vaporization case. If these molecules, these water molecules, are strongly attracted to each other, which we know that they are, right, because they have hydrogen bonding between each other, which is a very strong intermolecular force, then it's going to take a lot of energy to separate them specifically 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Interestingly, this is a lot more energy than it takes to heat a mole of water from zero to 100. It takes more energy 
to boil the water than to heat the water from 0 to 100. The reason for that is we're overcoming these very strong intermolecular forces. At the end of the day, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the, strong, the higher the enthalpy of vaporization and the enthalpy of fusion. So both enthalpy of vaporization and enthalpy of fusion are directly proportional with your intermolecular forces. Um, another type of enthalpy that you sometimes see is the enthalpy of sublimation. Sublimation, this is iodine here in this test tube, is going directly from the solid state to the gas phase. All right, dry ice is a common example of this, although it's hard to see dry ice, so that's why they use iodine, because you can take a picture of it. Iodine sublimes, it goes directly from a solid to a gas. The enthalpy of sublimation is roughly the same as the sum of the enthalpy of fusion and the enthalpy of vaporization. And that's not surprising, because we're going directly from the solid to the gas. We're just not stopping at the liquid in between. So it makes sense that both of these enthalpies would add up to the enthalpy of sublimation. This doesn't come up a lot, um, but it is an important thing to um, point out in this lecture. Okay, so let's look at these relationships with intermolecular forces and um, and uh, the enthalpy of fusion and the enthalpy of vaporization. So let's look at an example here. We're going to compare HCl and H2O. So HCl is polar and has dipole-dipole forces. H2O has hydrogen bonding, a stronger intermolecular force. If we look at the enthalpy of fusion, HCl with only dipole-dipole forces is much lower than H2O with hydrogen bonding. If we look at the enthalpy of vaporization, we notice the same trend. You may be noticing these aren't the exact same numbers that I showed you before. I showed you 6.01 and 40.7. It's just because these are four sig figs and I was giving you three sig figs before. End of the day, take home message. Enthalpy of fusion and vaporization are directly proportional to intermolecular forces. The stronger a hydrogen bonding has higher as compared to the dipole-dipole, okay? And like everything that we've talked about here, these are not absolute, um, but these rules will work for the examples provided for you in general chemistry. So, to review, properties related to intermolecular forces. There are several properties that are directly proportional to intermolecular forces. forces. Melting point, boiling point, viscosity, surface tension, enthalpy of vaporization, and enthalpy of fusion. There is only one property that we are talking about that is inversely proportional to intermolecular forces, and that is your vapor pressure. Remember that vapor pressure is the amount of molecules that go from the liquid phase into the gas phase. Once they're in the gas phase, they exert pressure, and that's the vapor pressure. The stronger the intermolecular forces in the liquid, the less likely the molecules are going to fly into the gas phase and exert pressure. That's why these, this one is inversely proportional. With these two charts, you should be able to answer um, many of the questions you would receive um, about these um, types of properties and um, the molecules that they're being um, asked about. So let's look at um, a couple of examples here. And like before, I'm going to switch over to the um, camera um, because um, I have these uh, printed out so that I can write on them. All right. So we have um, three hydrocarbons, pentane with five carbons, octane with eight carbons, and hexane with six carbons. As we talked about before, molecules that only contain carbon and hydrogen are nonpolar. In this case, these are all straight chain molecules, so it has nothing to do with their shape. It only has to do with their size. So pentane has five carbons, this has eight, this has six. So basically, we have the strongest dispersion forces in octane, because it's the heaviest, the highest molar mass, or because it has eight carbons, okay, and the lowest dispersion forces in pentane, because it only has five carbons. And again, they all only have dispersion forces because they're nonpolar, because um, they contain only carbon and hydrogen. I don't know how that happened, but that should be a three there. Okay, so that's basically what we have. Now we're asked something that at first may seem a little bit strange, but hopefully with this um, lecture video now kind of makes sense. It says rank in terms of increasing surface tension. 
So the very first thing I want to do is I want to put a one, two, and three next to the ones with um, highest to lowest intermolecular forces. So if we look at these, which one's gonna have the strongest intermolecular forces as we just talked about, it's this one because it's the highest molar mass. Again, they all only have dispersion forces. Followed by this one because it's intermediate as six instead of five carbons, but it has, so it has less than eight and more than five and this has the weakest intermolecular forces. So notice that I rank them in terms of intermolecular forces. Now I can answer the question about surface tension. So in the slide I just showed a minute ago, one of the factors that was directly proportional with surface tension uh, with intermolecular forces was surface tension. So it's directly proportional. So basically we rank in terms of um, intermolecular forces, the same way because it's directly proportional. So let's, look, let's take a look at this. It says rank in terms of increasing surface tension. Increasing means smallest first. Which one of these has the weakest intermolecular forces and therefore the lowest surface tension? It's going to be pentane. So A is less than, C is less than B, okay? So this one has the strongest intermolecular forces and therefore the strongest surface tension. This one has the weakest intermolecular forces and therefore the weakest surface tension. So we don't need to memorize a separate trend for surface tension. We just need to remember that it's directly proportional with intermolecular forces and that this question is really just asking me about which one has the strongest intermolecular forces. Well, let's look at the next one. It says rank in terms of increasing vapor pressure at the same temperature. Okay, so we have these three molecules all at the same temperature. Which one is going to have the highest slash lowest uh, vapor pressure? So since this is increasing order, we want the lowest one first. Notice that um, vapor pressure and intermolecular forces are inversely proportional. So the more the molecules stick together, the less of them are gonna fly into the gas phase and um, exert pressure. So this one has the strongest intermolecular forces, but it actually has the lowest vapor pressure. Okay, so we wanna put B less than, hexane is the intermediate, and the highest vapor pressure or the weakest intermolecular forces is going to be your pentane. So these are exact opposite order. Why? Because this one is directly proportional. Surface tension is directly proportional with intermolecular forces and vapor pressure is inversely proportional with intermolecular forces. Let's look at a second example here, okay? It says, consider the following molecules below. Rank in terms of decreasing velocity, viscosity, sorry, and rank in terms of decreasing enthalpy of vaporization. So first thing, I mean, you can do them in kind of different orders. So we're doing this one a little different order than the uh, last one. Viscosity and enthalpy of vaporization are both directly proportional to intermolecular forces. Said another way, the answer for this one and the answer for this one are gonna be the same because they're both just asking about um, intermolecular forces. Now let's look at this case, what we have as um, the strongest intermolecular force. First notice, we have molecules that are all about the same size, all right, similar molar masses, okay? We have acetone, we have acetic acid, and we again have um, pentane, okay? Acetone, the stuff in nail polish remover. What is the strongest intermolecular force here? Well, these carbon and hydrogen parts are nonpolar, but we have a carbon bonded to an oxygen and two methyl groups, CH3 groups. This carbon has different domains. It has an oxygen domain, a carbon domain, and a carbon domain, or a methyl domain, and a methyl domain. Since this molecule has three different domains with respect to this carbon, it's polar, and its strongest intermolecular force is dipole, dipole. Note that it does not have hydrogen bonding. Why doesn't it have hydrogen bonding? Because although it has an O and an H, they're not directly attached. Let's look at the next one, acetic acid, all right? We have a C bonded to an OH, an O, and a CH3. There's a dead giveaway here. We have an O directly bonded to an H. So if we have an O directly bonded to an H, the strongest intermolecular force is gonna be hydrogen bonding. And as we talked about in the previous question, this one only contains carbon and hydrogen. So the strongest intermolecular force is your dispersion forces, all right? Because that's the same molecule that we had in the last one. So it says rank in terms of decreasing viscosity. 
Before we do that, let's rank them in terms of their intermolecular forces, with one being the strongest, just like last time. This one has hydrogen bonding, so it's got the strongest intermolecular forces. This one has dipole-dipole, so it has the second strongest intermolecular forces. And this one only has dispersion, so it has the lowest um, intermolecular forces. So we want to rank in terms of decreasing viscosity, which means biggest first. The one with the biggest viscosity is also the one with the strongest intermolecular forces. So B, okay, is greater than dipole-dipole next, A is greater than C, because this only has dispersion forces. And the last one says, rank in terms of decreasing enthalpy of vaporization. Again, enthalpy of vaporization is also directly proportional to intermolecular forces. Since these are basically asking the same thing, you're going to get the exact same answer. B is less than A is less than C. All right, take home message is that we need to know whether each property is directly or inversely proportional to intermolecular forces, and we don't want to try to memorize trends for each of these properties separately. We want to think about these trends in terms of the intermolecular forces and why that is was explained um, during this video.